how they hustled. So many orders to buy, feet were no longer fast enough. And then they skated into limbo. Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929. The stock market collapsed like a house of cards. Panic ruled. Everybody called sell. Share prices had become inflated far above the real earning power of industry. The real crisis lay outside the stock exchange in an unhealthy, unbalanced world economy. When the crash came, millionaires went bankrupt overnight. So did companies and even countries. Suddenly, the world was poor. This was the Great Depression for millions of ordinary people who knew nothing of the stock exchange. An endless struggle for the privilege of earning their daily bread. Hundreds of thousands, face to face with starvation, were broken by the degrading handout. The popular song now was, Buddy, Can You Spare a Dime? Farmers lost everything. An impoverished world could not now afford to buy Canada's wheat, even at knockdown prices. To add to man-made folly, there came drought. Black blizzards carried off the parched soil, leaving a desert. The desperate farmer trekked to the city to join the unemployed. Thousands from the cities took to the road and toured their native land for the first time. The angry marched and demanded the right to work. Once again, there were ugly scenes between police and demonstrators and new political parties were formed in protest. Whatever else they blamed, they blamed the government in office. Mackenzie King was suddenly the villain of the peace, charged with lacking a policy. Bennett took over with the promise to blast his way into the markets of the world. His magic cure was to protect Canadian industry by raising tariffs. Other countries were doing the same. This tariff war was already strangling international trade. To Canada came the statesmen of the Commonwealth to try and break the vicious circle. The Ottawa agreements set lower tariffs between the Commonwealth partners. It was hoped that these measures would revive trade and start the long climb out of the Depression. People still had the spirit to admire progress. Rooftops swarmed as the airship R-100 glided in from England carrying 100 passengers. A few realized that Canada was now closely linked with Europe. From out of that narrowing sky in 1933 came a group of Italian flyers. It was the first time Canadians had seen the fascist salute, the salute of the dictatorships that had seized Italy and Germany. Montreal welcomed the visitors who boasted that Mussolini, like Hitler, had beaten the Depression. But most Canadians sought escape from their problems, not in drill, but in sport. What better than to dream of sailing away at the helm of the champion schooner Blue Nose? And a Canadian mother won a different kind of immortality. As the five Dion babies survived their first hours, the thoughts of millions were focused on Canada. For a moment, the world could forget the depression and the political storm clouds. But in the midst of celebrations, there were still protests. Voicing their discontent, the voters in 1935 dropped Bennett and again elected Mackenzie King. It fell to King to try and reunite an embittered generation. The recent Italian visitors were now on safari in Ethiopia. As they rained high explosives and poison gas on tribesmen armed with spears, the world discovered fascism's recipe for the depression. Now, surely, the League of Nations, formed to restrain aggression, would stay the hand of the bully. At Geneva, Haile Selassie pleaded for his country's life. As the League passed paper condemnations, Abyssinia was succumbing. Selassie's appeal was drowned by Mussolini's representative. 
and Canada's delegate had proposed a boycott of the aggressor. Ethiopia had some friends, but faced with the risk of having to keep the peace by force, the nations backed down. In Berlin at the 36 Olympics, the world had a first-hand view of how the Nazi fascist menace had grown in Germany. But like the rest of the world, Canadians were old-fashioned enough to regard the Olympic Games as a bridge of friendship. In deadly earnest, Hitler used the Games to parade before the visitors the glory of the Third Reich, while its victims were being paraded out of sight in concentration camps. Too many failed to understand that they might be its next victims. At this crucial period, England and the Commonwealth were preoccupied with a domestic crisis. The new king, Edward VIII, wished to marry a divorced woman. Rather than divide his people, he abdicated without being crowned. George was less well known than his brother. But he was a family man, and later the image of the royal family encouraged a strong affection throughout the Commonwealth. The future queen looked on as her father assumed the duties of monarch to the Commonwealth's unique family of nations. As war again loomed, America's relations seemed as important to Canada as her Commonwealth ties. President Roosevelt, receiving an honorary degree from Queen's University, made clear where his sympathies would lie in any future war. I give to you assurance that the people of the United States will not stand idly by if domination of Canadian soil is threatened by any other empire. Spain, 1937, and a new weapon, mass bombing of cities. Franco waged civil war against the elected Republican government. Hitler and Mussolini sent him troops and arms. Britain and France pledged non-intervention. Some felt it was time to act. More than a thousand Canadians fought a losing battle alongside the Loyalists. But most people in the democracies were preoccupied with their day-to-day -day lives. In Canada, the Depression was passing and a new generation could start thinking of jobs and careers. It began to look like a Hollywood ending where everyone lives happily ever after. After long, drab years, Canadians delighted in the dream world of fashion. As sleepers sometimes do, they tried not to be awakened by the noises next door. And in the night, Hitler marched into Austria. He knew in advance that no one would lift a finger. The Nazis celebrated a bloodless victory in Vienna. Czechoslovakia was next on the list. England's Chamberlain and Francis Delagny met Hitler and Mussolini in Munich as the world tensed for war. Accepting Hitler's promise that this would be his last territorial claim, they gave way. Back in London, Chamberlain told a grateful people that he had brought back peace with honor, peace in our time. Hitler's generals were already laying plans to seize Poland. Later, it was said that Chamberlain had at least gained time, time to prepare. An awakened world now looked to its defences. Canadians learned the bitter lesson that they did not live in a fireproof house, as they had once thought. There wasn't much time. The forces of the democracies were antiquated compared to Hitler's long-prepared war machine. Their fathers had fought in the last war, and soon it would be their turn. The war would wait for them to grow up. That summer of 39, young people enjoyed their last months of peace. It was only 21 years since armistice. Years of growth and expansion, depression and disillusion. In the midst of peace, why were they once more close to war? The first reigning monarch to visit Canada was left in no doubt that Canada would stand with Britain in a fight against tyranny. As George VI dedicated a memorial to the last war, his words foreshadowed the conflict to come. Peace and freedom 
cannot long be separated. It is well that we have in one of the world's capitals a visible reminder of so great a truth. For without freedom, there can be no enduring peace, and without peace, no enduring freedom. <laughs>